the chairman. But I don't know whether you know this, but every employee at the Ritz carries the credo, credo with them in their pocket. And I asked a couple of the wait staff tonight if they had theirs, and they immediately pulled it out. So this morning I was at breakfast, had my blue jeans on and my traveling shirt and ball cap, and I said to the uh, waitress, said, do you have your credo? And she kind of looked at me, what? I said, do you have your credo? Yes. Are you management? I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> but I said, I need a copy. I didn't bring my copy with me. And she said, I'll have to go check with a supervisor. And I'm sure she went and said, who is the guy with the blue jeans and the shirt? Anyway, she came back and said, here you are, sir. But uh, it's, you can do this. Go up and down the hallway, and if you see a, a Ritz employee, uh, ask them to stop for a second and uh, tell you about the credo. And it goes on for four little pages. But uh, the motto is, we are ladies and gentlemen serving ladies and gentlemen. And we have three steps of service. And I think this applies to the energy industry, the airline industry. A warm and sincere greeting. Use the guest's name. Anticipation and fulfillment of each guest's needs. And a fond farewell. Give them a warm goodbye and use the guest's name. You know, I think the staff here tonight has uh, done a marvelous job. Let's give them a, a round of applause. And I think we all appreciate and, and love uh, good service. It was my first day at Braniff International. After I left Southwest, I went to, uh, was recruited to go to Braniff and try to save them. They were in big financial trouble. And as I sat today, and uh, I sat through your uh, distributed energy uh, panels discussion this afternoon, I thought there were so many similarities that uh, have happened to me in, in taking Braniff through Chapter 11, in going through airline deregulation, which is, was started in 1979, and in going through restructuring and acquisitions and mergers and on and on. But I made a lot of notes today, but here are nine things that I thought you all have on your plate coming down the road. One, you can count on restructuring, you can count on consolidation, you can count on acquisitions, you can count on failures. If you had this meeting in five years from now, some of you, unfortunately, your companies probably won't be around. Two, what business are you really in? This is really important, and one of the panelists today I thought nailed it when he said, you know, I'm good at one thing, I'm so-so at two things, but more than that, I'm probably not good at any. And that's when we figured out at Southwest Airlines, we weren't an airline, we were in mass transportation, we were a cattle car. Now that's a different kind of business entirely. And we'll talk a little bit more about, uh, talk a little more about that later. Simplify, somebody else mentioned that one. Southwest today, still only one kind of airplane, over 700 737s. Every pilot can fly every airplane. One pilot spare parts. That's an exaggeration. There are several kinds of 737s, but it is much simpler. It's simpler for the employees, and the customers understand the systems as well. Prices. Prices will go down. Prices today in the airline industry are 30% below where they were in 1979. Now, that does not include all these nickel and dime baggage fees and all that they have added on. <laughs> which is worth the last I saw about $10 billion. And Southwest Airlines does not charge for bags. I hope they hang on to that. So once you figure out what business you're really in, look for a niche. We always tried to find airports that were abandoned or nobody else wanted to go to. Why fight the competition head to head if you can go around them, maneuver around them? Keep educating and training not only your customers and employees, but the regulators. Uh, the regulators need to be trained. And you see, can see what's happening around the country right now as people are trying to change things for solar or wind, whatever. 
You've got to spend time on that and band together as a group and be sure the legislators and the regulators and the customers all understand what direction you're going for. Focus on the employees and the customers. You know, the mantra over the door at Southwest Airlines has always been higher attitudes develop skills. Higher attitudes develop skills. If you get the right people, the customer service thing is easy. Herb Kelleher used to say, you know what the most imp important person is in our company? And the media would always want to say the shareholder. He said, no, the most important person is the employee. Number two then is the customer. If the employee understands it and you got the right one, they'll pass it on to the customer. And if that works, the shareholder will be the big beneficiary of it all. And innovation. Innovation comes in many different forms. And your industry will thrive, I would predict, in the next five to 10 years on innovation. Stuff we haven't even thought of today. But it won't happen from within unless all of your employees feel they have the opportunity to take some risk, not safety, but take some risk business-wise, come up and try some things that may cost you some money. You know, we, we never wrote those in-flight announcements for the Southwest employees. Uh, you can't teach people to say the kinds of things that they say. Uh, I heard one the other day going from Reno to uh, San Diego, and those of you from uh, Boston like Sonny will not appreciate this, <laughs> but the male flight attendant said, you know, we're gonna do the life vest demonstration now, and they go through and he gets ready to do this. And he said, and your life vest will inflate unless you're sitting by Tom Brady. <laughs> and the final one I wrote down was that your customers will band together. Uh, one of the panelists talked about selling uh, uh, solar to his neighbors and so forth. We saw a lot of that in the deregulation of the airline industry. Travel agents got together to form groups. Businesses got together to form groups to get advantages in pricing. So get used to it, uh, it it's, it's gonna happen. My first day at, at Braniff is when I met Bill Marriott by phone. And Phil Guthrie, my CFO, went with me from Southwest to Braniff. I had hired him at Southwest. We worked together closely for three years. We tripled in size, we tripled in profitability. We went through deregulation, we ordered new airplanes, and we'd had a great three-year run. So when the Braniff Board of Directors came after me to recruit me to come leave Southwest and see if we could save or restructure Braniff International, which was a billion dollar company with 10,000 employees flying to about eight countries. Uh, I was ready for another challenge. So I agreed to go. The problem was the due diligence that I looked at uh, was not accurate. And once Phil and I agreed we would do it, it took another two weeks or so before we were able to leave and go to Branham. They had paid off nearly $200 million worth of payables. They were so far behind financially. So when we arrived on a Sunday afternoon and, and we moved from Love Field to DFW from Southwest to Braniff in my old Chevy pickup, and Phil's in his office, I'm in mine, and now he's got the real numbers. And I hear some unkind words coming from next door. I went over and he said, we've been had. We've only got 10 days of cash. So you got a billion dollar company, 10,000 employees in about eight countries, and you've got 10 days of cash. That'll bring a lump to your throat. And I wanted to pick up the phone and call Herb Kelleher and say, Herb, I was just kidding. I didn't mean to resign. <laughs> Too late. I made the decision to go. And we did it to, as, as husband and wives. Phil and Beverly and Krista and I sat down together for three hours talking about the risk and all. But none of us figured the risk was 100%. I gave it a 50% chance we could save it. And I was willing to, uh, to take that risk. So Phil and I sat there on that Sunday afternoon looking at each other and I said, you know what? You and I are gonna to have to do this ourselves. We don't have time for committees. 
We don't have time for consultants. Look at this organization chart, Phil. We got seven layers of management. We got 50 vice presidents. And we've got about 600 staff that we probably don't need. And I said, if you and I are gonna save this thing, here's what I'm gonna do. And I don't recommend this, by the way. I'm gonna be arbitrary, and I just drew a line through two entire levels of management, which took out over 20 vice presidents and about 600 staff. And I said, tomorrow, that's our first assignment, and it's not gonna be a fun day. So I'm in early the next morning. The first thing I had to do was interview to get a secretary. And I had told the HR people over the weekend, just give me the two best ones we have, and I'll take one. And I did, I took Irma, who was outstanding. So by eight o'clock, I've got a secretary. Irma answers the first phone call. She comes running in and she said, it's Bill Marriott, and he is very unhappy. <laughs> uh, I knew why, Branov owed him a lot of money for food and, and beverage. So I got on the phone in my best sales and marketing voice and said, good morning, Mr. Marriott. Good morning. You owe me $7 million. Yes, sir, I, that's probably accurate. And if you don't pay me in 24 hours, I'm gonna cut you off. I said, Mr. Marriott, this place is a disaster. I don't know whether I can pay you or not. Then I'm cutting you off. I said, okay, give me the 24 hours. Let me see what I can do. So I went and sat down with Phil Guthrie. We went through the numbers. There's no way we could come up with seven million. So Phil said, just tell him we'll pay him cash from here forward. And if we save this company, he'll get his seven million. So I called him back the next morning. He took the call. I said, Mr. Marriott, I can't pay you the seven million. He said, that's what I thought and I'm cutting you off. And I'd already figured out what I was gonna say. I had nothing to lose. I said, go ahead. Nobody likes your damn food anyway. <laughs> And he began to chuckle <laughs> and he said, you made your point, I'll work with you. And he, did, and he did. And I called him every month to tell him what was going on and we became friends. But unfortunately, seven months later when we had to put it into chapter 11, he lost his $7 million. So the years go by and now I'm writing the book that Mark mentioned for Harper Collins. And uh, they said, you gotta get some testimonials get some big names. And I thought, what better name than Bill Marriott Jr.? So I called up, probably it was seven years later, got the same secretary, and she remembered me. And she said, what may I do for you? And I said, I'd like Mr. Marriott to write a testimonial for the cover of my book. <laughs> and she said, you gotta be kidding. <laughs> and I said, would I kid about something like this? I said, just ask him for me. She said, well, I already know his answer, but I'll ask him. Couldn't have been more than 15 minutes later, she called back very sheepishly and she said, he said he would do it. <laughs> and she said, here's what he wants to say. And he already written it out. And I can't do it verbatim, but it was something like, Howard was always honest with me in difficult times and told me the truth. And I admired his ethics. It, it, it was great. So uh, she said, I wouldn't have believed it. So I thought, my day is now, we're moving. Irma comes back in and said, the FBI is in the lobby. <laughs> I said, I don't know what for, but bring them in. They came in and sat down, there were two of them, and they said, uh, I understand this is your first day. And I said, yes, sir. He says, I just want you to know we're gonna go arrest your director of fuel purchases. You know, he's taken money under the table from some of the vendors. I said, fine. I said, <laughs> what's his name? And I didn't even know what his name was. So they were gone. 10 minutes later, Irma's in again. The head of security is here for Braniff. Now what? He comes in and he said, you know, I hate to tell you this on your first day, but we've got a theft ring at DFW and we haven't been able to catch him. And they're stealing out of luggage. They're taking pharmaceuticals, diamonds, whatever. And I said, I'll tell you what you do. I gave him a name in Dallas of the chief of police that I knew from my days at Southwest. I said, see if we can round up some officers that are on their days off that'll come load bags and put them in uniforms and mix them in with the group and let's see what we can find. So he did. And finally by uh, then it's now 10 o'clock. <laughs> I couldn't figure out that anything else too bad could happen the rest of the day. 
And as I recall, it was pretty smooth. So a couple of weeks later, uh, I brought my coveralls in and, and uh, I always loaded bags at Southwest and, and United because that's where I started at Capital Airlines on the ramp at Midway, as Mark mentioned. And I just show up unannounced, load bags for a couple of hours, don't tell anybody you're coming, and it's amazing the impact that it has across the company. Pilots can see it out the cockpit airplane. Hey, the president's down there loading bags. And you only have to do it about once or twice a year. So I'm up in the belly pit of the 727, and this young man and I were throwing the bags out on the conveyor belt. No, we're carefully unloading your luggage. <laughs> That's why I carry mine on. <laughs> he said, Howard, are we gonna make it? I said, I don't know. I said, it's touch and go. And I was always very candid with the em em employees and it paid off. I used to have a phrase I used, you know, open the kimono, show them what you got. And my wife keeps saying, don't use that phrase, Howard. <laughs> but that's the way it works. Anyway, I said, I don't know. We got 10 days of cash. Plus that, we've got a theft ring here at DFW. And your fellow employees are stealing us blind. And he stopped unloading the bags and he said, can I trust you? I said, if you're gonna give me some information, I'll keep, it, keep your name out of it. He said, try gates 21 to 23 between 10 o'clock and midnight. That's all I can tell you. So immediately the light went on. Everybody else knows who the thieves are these are, except management. So I got off the airplane after that flight, went to the phone, called the head of security, and I said, assign those off-duty policemen to the afternoon shift, gates 21 to 23, and that's where I think you'll find some action. I guess another three weeks went by, and he called me on, it was on Christmas Eve. Chris and I were just getting ready to go to church, and he called, and he said, we got them. I said, you got what? He said, we caught 22 of them. It's a whole ring. And he said, I've got them locked up in the locker room. <laughs> what do you want me to do with them? <laughs> I said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to fire them immediately. I want you to put them in jail for a night. I want them to spend Christmas in jail. Then call Sam Coates at home and have, get him, tell him to get a press release out. And tell the world that Braniff has just filed fired 22 of their employees, and although we're in financial difficulties, we haven't lost our integrity and our pride in doing what's right. And I said, and one other call, call the head of the union and uh, let him know that we're doing this, and if he wants to grieve it and fight it, tell him to call me uh, at home tonight and we'll talk about it. I never, I never heard from him. I couldn't have done anything more uh, positive than taking that action that night. The rest of the employees finally said, maybe we finally have somebody in management that cares and somebody that will trust us, or somebody that we can trust and somebody that's honest. So in all the restructuring and the, and the new things that are going on in your company and in your industry, never lose sight of that integrity and that honesty. And when we finally got Braniff, you know, we had to put it into bankruptcy, when we finally brought it out 16 months later, uh, successfully, there was never one single lawsuit filed against management or the board of directors or previous management. Uh, and I'm convinced it was because our little team was open and, and honest with them. And we had a lot of fun. I mean, the, the uh, pressure was tremendous. It was six days a week, 12, 14 hours a day, constant calls from the media. I did over 2,000 interviews in uh, seven, 18 months over 2,000 interviews by phone or in person. And we always just made ourselves available and we didn't hide anything uh, like what's going on in politics uh, around the world uh, today. I had a great small team with Phil Guthrie, the CFO, and Sam Coates, who, uh, who today is the chairman of the DFW Airport Board, and we're, Phil and he and I are still, still close together. And Sam had a great sense of humor, and every morning we would get together at about 7.45 in the boardroom, five or six of us, have a cup of coffee, cheer each other up to try to get through uh, one more long day. 
And Sam, it was about that time when the, the movie Airport had come out, if you remember that. And the guy would say, you know, what a week we picked to stop sniffing glue. <laughs> so Sam would come in with his cup of coffee saying, what a week we picked to stop drinking. What a week we picked to... Well, employees would be walking by and they'd say, hey, those guys in there are talking about taking drugs and drinking. Well, they, they understood it was a joke. But the big one that Sam did was we all had security badges, just like I'm sure you do, and you can't see it from here, but that was my Howard Putnam security badge with my picture on it. But what he did without me knowing it is he had another security badge printed up and changed my name. And they stuck it on my coat one day when I wasn't looking, and I'm walking down the hall saying hello to employees at the headquarters, and they're all laughing at me. And I finally, and then they'd look down at my badge. So I finally took my badge off and looked at it, and my name was Shithead. <laughs> that, that, that was a keepsake. <laughs> and finally, at the end of Braniff, and then we'll visit about Southwest a little bit. Uh, the end of Braniff, uh, we all got, once we put it into bankruptcy, the stress just, we just sort of collapsed and we all got sick. The flu, I guess our adrenaline stopped flowing. And we had to narrow down the group. We went from 10,000 employees down to about 35 to, uh, to reorganize the company. But the morale was so great after we filed for bankruptcy, the employees were really into it by then. They came to work for two or three days even though they weren't on the payroll. And we had to go tell them, go home, we can't pay you. But that was a loyalty that I will uh, always remember, never forget. But I was, I was pretty stressed after all that and discouraged for a little while after we put it in bankruptcy. And I'm thinking, I kind of got into that poor Howard syndrome. Poor Howard, you left Southwest. Poor Howard, now you're in bankruptcy. Poor Howard, you got all this billion dollars worth of debt to pay off. Poor Howard, poor Howard. And I was not being productive. So I'm driving to work early one morning and I had my life-changing experience. Going down a two-lane road uh, from Plano, Texas to uh, DFW. Some of you from Texas may know where it is, 121. And I wasn't tailgating, but I had my mind in a funk. And I know we've all done this. You get to the office and you say, how'd I get here? I don't remember. And I was doing that every day. So I'm following this big truck one morning and it's got a crane built back on the platform. And I wasn't tailgating, and good thing, because suddenly the guy's drive shaft broke and came out from under the truck. So here came about a 10 or 12 foot missile heading straight for my windshield. So I accelerated and it went over the top of the car. And I came out of my funk real quick. And I thought, wow, I was really lucky. And about that time, his transmission housing fell off. <laughs> Here I come, and I, I ran over. So he pulls off the side of the road, and uh, he has no locomotion, so I pull off behind him. He gets out. He didn't even pay any attention to me. He was the typical good old Texas boy, big guy, bib overhauls, the buttons on the side unfastened. He had boots on with mud on them. He had about a two-day growth of beer, and he had a railroad engineer's cap on. And this truck had a big crane on it, so he was heading to go dig something somewhere or build something. Anyway, he starts walking around this big rig complaining about what a bad day he's having. He got stuck in the mud out by McKinney, and now he's going to be late for the next job. And the boss is going to be mad. And he doesn't pay attention to me. I look under my car, and it's dripping a little oil. But I waited till he came around about on his third revolution and I intercepted him and I said, sir, why don't you come get in the car with me? We'll go into Louisville, we'll find a payphone, we'll call your boss, you can tell him all of your troubles and I wanna to talk to him and see what kind of insurance you got and we'll get on with our <laughs> lives. So he gets in. And of course, Braniff had had so, so much publicity before we put it into chapter 11. We were on TV and everything every day. And we start driving along and I'm dressed up <laughs> and he starts moaning and groaning again about what a bad day he's having and yada yada. And finally he looks over at me and he said, hey Mac, what do you do for a living? I said, I'm the president of Braniff. 
He said, damn, I thought I was having a bad day. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was at United Airlines as the head of marketing, and it was about a year before airline deregulation was passed. Uh, United sent me to Harvard to the advanced management program uh, for 13 weeks. A great, great experience. And for the O's of you from the Boston area, it was in February of 1978 when you had the, then the biggest snowstorm of three feet or something. I think you've surpassed that now. But while we were there, Harvard had two airline case studies, Southwest and Braniff. Braniff was a great success under regulation. So, of course, I was the only airline guy in the class, so I was supposedly the expert. But what I didn't realize is that within three years, I'd be the CEO of both of those airlines. That's kind of weird. And when I got back to Chicago in May, the first phone call I took and I always answered my own phone but from a headhunter in Dallas, Texas and said, your name is in consideration for CEO of Southwest Airlines. And I said, oh, kind of arrogantly, how'd you know I'd been to Harvard? He said, I didn't know you'd been to Harvard and I really don't care. He said, we're looking for somebody with marketing background and professional management experience that can take a small fledgling company and take it to the next level. And it hit me at the right time. I mean, I was, I, I was, uh, the United Airlines was a great company in those days. And, but we had 50,000 employees and there were just meetings after meetings after meetings. And it seemed like we planned 50 weeks out of the year and went on vacation for two and then we came back and planned, but we never seemed to implement. I see a few of you laughing, you've been through this uh, as well. So, I ended up going to, to Southwest, and uh, the CEO of United at that time was not very happy that I left, but I told him, you know, I've always wanted to run my own company, and here's the chance, and I think these guys have got the, the right idea. United was in favor of deregulation, the only large airline that favored airline deregulation. All the rest were against it. Southwest, on the other hand, was the smallest airline in the country, and they were in favor of deregulation. Kind of interesting concept. So when I got to Southwest, Herb Kelleher and I had sat down and after we interviewed, and I interviewed with the board, and I told Herb, you know, I'm willing to leave United and come here, but I gotta be certain that you guys are gonna continue to change the way the game is played. There's that old story, you know, some people play the game, others change the way the game is played. And I said, I think you're on the right track. And if deregulation does occur, uh, I'd like to be a part of that. And we shook hands and that was it. So I told Herb on day one, I, I figured out I've got three things to do with your help and the team. One, we got to get a vision statement down on a piece of paper. Because there was, there was no budgets, it was pretty much run loosey-goosey, it was working, and, and they were starting to make money, but there was no flight plan. So I said, we gotta have a vision, we gotta figure out what business we're in, and then we've gotta develop the culture that, that supports this. And Herb agreed. So one of the first things we did was we took the team off-site, and it took us a day and a half. And if you haven't gone through this experience, I highly recommend it. But I, I moderated it, facilitated it, and I just said to the group of about nine, including Herb, we're not leaving this room until we can write up on the wall in 100 words or less. What are we going to be when we grow up? What if deregulation does happen? What are we going to do? So we argued for 10 hours that day. You know, well, we ought to buy 747s. We ought to fly to Hawaii. We ought to do this. We do that. And at that time, Southwest only flew within the state of Texas because you couldn't get out of Texas because of the... Civil, Aer Civil Aeronautics Board had not approved a new route or an airline uh, in years, and that was part of, the, part of the problem. They regulated the prices, they regulated where you flew, et cetera, et cetera. So after 10 hours, we took a break, went to our house out in Plano and had some beer and hot dogs and everybody got loosened up. And the next morning when we came back, it was amazing. Within an hour, it hit all of us. It wasn't my idea, and that was the best part. It wasn't my idea, but we figured out then we weren't an airline, that we were in mass transportation. And that was the single business we stayed in. 
Now we knew how to do, we thought we knew how to do one thing very well. And regardless of what everybody else did, uh, this was the route we were gonna go. About that same time, when I first got to Southwest, they had a reception for me with the business community downtown one evening, and one of our board members was a banker. And there were probably 250 executives from all over North Texas, great evening. But when everybody was leaving and I was shaking hands with everybody, there was one person still over at the hors d'oeuvre table. I could see the back of the person. So I went over to see who it was and who was it, but the chairman of the board and the CEO of Braniff International, Harding Lawrence, the man who had done such a great job under regulation. And he had big bushy eyebrows, kind of like Howard Hughes. And he turned to me and he said, Mr. Putnam, do you think airline deregulation will occur? And I said, yes, Mr. Lawrence, I think it w will. And we're planning for it. And he said, so do I, and I'm planning for it also. And then he couldn't resist telling me what his plan was. His, his ego was already erupting. And you gotta be careful of that in this industry as all the new opportunities arrive. He said, I think deregulation will happen, but it won't last long. The public won't stand for it, so there'll be re-regulation. So I'm gonna expand as quick as I can and get my flag in as many cities and countries as possible before they stop it and send it back the other way. She took my hand and he left. I went home and told Krista, I said, told her what happened. I said, that man is obsessed. He is already gonna do it no matter what it costs him. And he did. And he borrowed another three or four, deregulation happened in about four months later. And he borrowed about $400 million to buy airplanes and all kinds of stuff. He let the union contracts get totally out of control and the losses began to begin. So his first route that he picked, you could have one free route in the first 90 days, I think, of deregulation. He took uh, Dallas to London or Dallas to Seoul, Korea. I forget which one. And what did we take at Southwest Airlines? We took Dallas Love Field to New Orleans. Everybody said, boy, that's, that's really exciting. <laughs> and that was our first little interstate hop. But you know what? We had figured out that if you follow the interstate highways between two cities, and they're not more than about 250 miles apart, you know, people drive back and forth a lot to do business. What if we could get them out of the automobile and get them in the airplane? What does it take to do that? And it takes a fare that was comparable to what you'd pay in driving. And we learned that if it was under 300 miles round trip, uh, you could, and you put in seven flights a day, you could double the size of the market within a year. You would like it from Dallas to Oklahoma City, 240,000 people had flown the year before DFW to Oklahoma City. A year after we went from Dallas Love to Oklahoma City, we carried 240,000. The other 240,000 were still there. We didn't take it away. We created a new market. We expanded the size of the pie. And I think that's one of your challenges now <clears throat> with solar, et cetera. It's expanding that pie and not just stealing, stealing from each other. So the system worked. We just stuck with it. We just kept ordering 737s, ordering 737s, nothing else. And I went to lunch one time with the then CEO of, United, or of uh, American Airlines, Bob Crandall, some of you may remember. Bob was a great guy, tough competitor. We had our differences, but uh, he, he was a very talented executive. So as we come out of lunch, <laughs> we're going to our cars, and he said, you know, Howard, your little airline's not gonna make it. You don't have any first class. You don't have any, you don't have any uh, meals. You don't exchange tickets and baggage with other airlines. Your flight attendants wear short pants and boots. Your airplanes are painted up, a crappy color, he used a different <laughs> word. You don't even go anywhere. And I said, Bob, we go one place American doesn't. He said, where's that? I said, to the bank. <laughs> So two years go by and we can begin to see that you know, we've got the right momentum, we've got the right concept. We just kept hiring more flight attendants that 
had the right attitudes. And we found out that uniform in the early days uh, of the shorts and the boots, uh, and we only had female flight attendants at the beginning. That uniform was attracting a certain kind of young lady. And we did a survey of a whole group of the early flight attendants. And what we found was they all had great attitudes. They were all team players. They all loved people. They had either in high school or college been cheerleaders, drum majorettes, or baton twirlers. They liked to have fun. They thought in macro terms. Just tell me broadly what you want me to do on this airplane and then get out of my way and don't bother me with all the rules and the, the details. So we said, if it works for flight attendants, why wouldn't it work for other employees? And we began to expand the concept and hiring people in accounting, et cetera. It still works. I talked to Gary Kelly about a year ago. He's the CEO. And, excuse me, I said, are you still hiring attitudes? And I rambled off all these things I've just given you that we had on the list. He said, exactly. And we still, we still are very careful about who we interview. And he had a story in their in-flight magazine about two years ago, you may have seen, that it's easier to get into Harvard University than it is to get a job with Southwest Airlines. They had gotten over 200,000 applications for employment that year, two years ago, that were uh, not solicited. They didn't ask for it. People could see how clear the brand is, and that's what you all have to work on. How do you separate your brand from somebody else in an industry that's going to be uh, crowded with a tremendous competition in the next two, three, four, five years. But the brand is so clear at Southwest that people say, I would be a fit for that company and I would like to work there. So the fun part has been so important and, it, and we made everybody be a part of it. And the uh, training group in the, in the people department came to me one day and said, you know, if we bought our own TV camera, uh, we have an employee that works in maintenance or somewhere who does TV production part-time on weekends for some college. And we could, get, we could do this really inexpensively. So I said, give me a cost estimate, and they did. I think it was less than $2,000. So I said, go ahead. And it was a good morale booster as well. So the first training film they did was on uh, back injuries ramp agents unloading airplanes incorrectly. And so they put a uniform on me and I had my back to the camera and I'm supposed to unload the bags incorrectly. And then the punchline was the fun part was, you know, even the president doesn't know how to unload a bag, right? And that was the kind of stuff they did. Then they came and said, we wanna do another one, but we need your permission to have an airplane for about three hours over at the hangar some night between 10 o'clock and 1 a.m. And I said, what are you gonna do now? Well, we need to do a training film on carry-on luggage. Carry-on luggage has really become a problem. And obviously we didn't fix this one. <laughs> 30 years later, it's still a problem. So I said, okay, what's your deal? Well, we're gonna hire an actress and we're gonna give her a very unusual piece of carry-on luggage. And then we want to have Cindy, who was the flight attendant of the year, be on the airplane. And all we'll tell Cindy is that she's going to, have, she's going to be videotaped and she's going to have a passenger come on with an unusual piece of luggage. And she has to extemporaneously show us all how she handles it. And, and Cindy was flight attendant of the year, uh, more good letters than anybody else. Had a few bad letters because Cindy had a habit of using profanity. Uh, so anyway, we thought it was worth the risk. So it's 10 o'clock at night at the hangar. Cindy is standing on the airplane. Typical early Southwest flight attendant. The long hair, young lady from Texas, good looking, very talented. Uh, Texas drawl. And so here comes the actress on the airplane. And they hired a Hispanic actress and they gave her a pinata. A gigantic pinata. She comes on the airplane and Cindy says, good evening, ma'am, welcome aboard Southwest Airlines. And the actress had been told, just go right on by her and go sit down. Now there's nobody else on the airplane, it's just Cindy and the actress. 
So the actress is sitting there with a pinata in her lap. Cindy comes over and in the typical style says, excuse me, ma'am, federal aviation regulations require that that go in the overhead bin or underneath your seat. No response. Cindy says, I, maybe you didn't hear me. I said, the FAA, yada, yada, goes in the overhead bin or under the seat. And now Cindy begins to forget that she's on camera. <laughs> and so the actress finally says, after about three iterations of this, you don't understand. It was my son's birthday. They gave me this pinata. If I put it up there, it's going to get smashed. If I put it under the seat, it's going to get smashed. I'm not moving it. I'm holding it. I don't care what you say. <laughs> With that, Cindy lost it. She reached for the pinata and said, you give me that pinata or I'm going to shove it up your ass. <laughs> Cut. <laughs> so the next morning, the team shows up at my office and they kind of come in like this. <laughs> How'd it go last night? Well, not so good. Well, have you got a video? Yeah, we got a video. I want to see the video. So we went in the conference room. They showed me the video. It was only about four minutes long. I fell out of my chair laughing. <laughs> I said, that's great. Use it. So that was our training video for the next <laughs> two, two years. <laughs> I, still hear, I still hear from Cindy at Christmas, and she lives in North Texas, and I think her kids are in college now, and she's out of the airline industry. I see she's on, uh, on Facebook uh, a, a lot as well. But just a final thought here, and we'll get you out of here. So you've had a long day. And, I intentionally did not use slides tonight because I figured you'd had enough slides uh, for the day. But two final points. Uh, our son Mike, who's the, he's the captain for America now, he was with US Air and Piedmont before that. But when Mike was about four years old, we were driving from Chicago uh, down to Chillicothe, Missouri to see my parents. And we started it out about 11 o'clock at night after I got off work. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we got as far as Hannibal, Missouri on the, uh, on the Mississippi River. And we went into this little old truck stop restaurant and where uh, usually waitresses don't pay much attention to little kids. And flight attendants don't either sometimes. But uh, this waitress did. And she bought, brought Mike a, a high chair. She brought him a menu. She brought him a glass of water, uh, silverware, the whole nine yards. And he had the menu upside down because <laughs> he couldn't read. And uh, he was in the audience one day when I told this. And I said, can you read yet? And uh, <laughs> that didn't go over very well. Uh, anyway, he sat there with that upside down and he couldn't read. And he turned to his mother, Krista, and he said, hey, mom, she thinks I'm a people. <laughs> and I used to use that story at Southwest. You know, every one of these folks is a people. Eddie Carlson, the chairman of United Airlines, my old boss, used to say to the flight attendants, every flight is opening night for somebody. There's somebody on your flight that has never flown before. Just think of the first time you went to a Broadway play. Those people on stage had done it 500 times, but it's the first time for you. So it's the first flight. It's opening night for somebody. I thought that was always a powerful way to say it. A good friend of mine is named Art Holst. Uh, Art is 94 years old now. He's a former NFL official. He, his teammate and boss, was Jim Tunney, the famous uh, NFL referee. From They worked three Super Bowls together and all. And Art writes poetry. I met him through speaking. He's still speaking at 94, lives in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And he writes poetry. And so I asked him a few years ago when we were together at a retreat, Art, could you write a little short poem for me that I could use sometimes when I'm speaking? And he has a very deep voice, and he said, what do you want it to be about? And I said, well, you know, aviation's been my life. Uh, the stars, space, integrity, technology, people, something like that, Art. He went off in a corner, 20 minutes later he came back, handed me a yellow sheet of paper, and this is what he had written. And he called it To the Stars by Art Holst. And he said, over 100 years have passed. 
since Orv and Wilbur Wright upon the sands of Kitty Hawk made that monumental flight. And in our eternal searchings to make things better soon, we've gone from Kitty Hawk to Lindbergh to Armstrong and Cernan on the moon. And now we look beyond those clouds to travel to the stars. But balance is the partner of technology and schemes. And dedicated people make reality out of dreams. So, as we close this session, a final thought I have to share. How you perceive the future will chart the course to get you there. Thank you. God bless America.